give me this chance to talk about some recent work we've done on flames in uh, turbulent flow. And I would have really liked to for all of us to be together in person. But nevertheless, this is a, a nice opportunity. So okay, so let's get started. So today I'll be talking about uh, a fluttering flame uh, and its intermittency and how this connects uh, eventually to the KPZ equation. So I'm at the chemical engineering department at uh, the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay, in Mumbai. So my main collaborator on this work is uh, a recently graduated uh, a PhD student, Amitesh Roy. And he, is at, he did his PhD at IIT Madras. So this is Amitesh. And he's looking for a postdoc, uh, by the way. So if uh, anyone has an opening and would be interested, uh, do let me know. So he did his PhD with uh, Sujit at IIT Madras. And uh, our, our other collaborators are Benjamin Emerson and Tim Lewin at Georgia Tech. OK, so uh, a flame, a fluttering flame is uh, quite fascinating to watch. It's something that you know you can stare at for quite a while. And I'm sure it's something that also uh, fascinated our early ancestors who you know discovered fire. And I think one of the things that you know makes it so interesting is the fact that you know such a flame undergoes you know these big excursions, this bursting kind of behavior. And uh, underlying that is a sort of intermittency, which is of a large scale in the sense that it involves the large scale motions of the flame. Uh, which can have this uh, on-off type bursting dynamics. So this large-scale intermittency has been well recognized in the combustion literature and in flame dynamics and has been extensively characterized and in a sense is akin to the kind of uh, intermittency one sees in non-homogeneous transitional turbulent flows. But that's not what I'll be talking about mainly today. Instead, if you look at engineered flames, so I'm talking about flames in a combustor in a jet engine and things like this, which are well controlled, well maintained. And if you go to the region of the flame, you know, where it's sustained and well maintained, uh, it appears relatively boring in the sense that there are fluctuations, but they're typically Gaussian. Uh, but even having said that, uh, if, the if you're in a turbulent combustor and the flow around the flame is turbulent, one realizes that these flames and their fluctuations actually span the inertial range of the underlying turbulent flow. And so a natural question arises whether these fluctuations, though they may appear Gaussian, if one would look at, for example, the increments, would you start to see a non-Gaussian signature? So in other words, do flames contain an additional uh, inner intermittency or small scale intermittency associated with the small scale uh, a pan, uh, albeit uh, self, which may appear to be self-similar fluctuations, but which may actually hide a multi-scaling behavior. So this was actually postulated uh, by people quite a while back, and Srinivasan summarizes the situation and uh, terms this kind of multi-scaling behavior as inner intermittency to contrast it with the large-scale uh, intermittency of you know the non-homogeneous overall flow, which he called outer intermittency. So the question is. Uh, it, it does seem like it should exist from uh, various arguments, as we'll see as, uh, as I go along. Uh, but what we've done here is provide, uh, we think, the first experimental evidence for it. Okay, so before I go there, the first question is, what is a flame? So you can have uh, different kinds of flames, typically uh, premixed or non-premixed. So a premixed flame is uh, essentially a situation where you have the fuel and the oxidant are literally pre-mixed together and then they are ignited. And in the other case, you have fuel and oxygen on either side of the flame. So I'll focus on pre-mixed uh, flames today. Uh, so in a pre-mixed situation, right, you, the flame is essentially a surface embedded in, in the flow that separates out the burned from unburned uh, stuff. And so a schematic is shown here where this line is, the surface is the flame. And uh, of course the flame now can get distorted by the flow, but uh, it also has its own self-propagation because of the active burning of the uh, unburned stuff, right? So it uh, propagates from the burn towards the unburned material, and it propagates perpendicular to its surface, as you see here. So one can uh, essentially think of uh, a flame as a self-propagating sur surface embedded in the flow. 
and it's a kind of canonical let's say example of these systems of self propagating systems uh, so there are different regimes i just want to clarify this before i continue so if you think of the uh, kolmogorov length scale of the turbulent flow and compare it to the thickness of the flame so if the kolmogorov length is much much larger than the flame thickness then in terms of the flow the the flame really is an infinitesimally thin surface so it that's what we would call a thin flame and this is really uh, the regime that's most amenable to uh, mathematical description of the nature i'll be going into a bit later the other extreme is where the kolmogorov length is much smaller than the thickness of the flame so by the way the thickness of the flame is something determined by the uh, chemical properties of the fuel and oxidant essentially it's their diffusivities molecular diffusivities and the uh, reaction rates involved the in the combustion process uh, so that is something that's determined by just the chemical properties of what you're burning and now that uh, thickness if you contrast with the property of the flow uh, namely the kolmogorov length so now if that kolmogorov length is much smaller than the thickness essentially the turbulent flow can penetrate the flame and start to mix it up and really in this re alternative regime there is really no flame instead you can just think of this as a reacting flow you can't really identify a flame and then you have the moderate situation where uh, the uh, turbulence can penetrate the flame and broaden it a bit but you can still identify a flame surface so this you would call a flame with some finite thickness a diffuse flame and experimentally we are actually in this regime uh, but even though you're here you can still describe the flame surface and with some corrections you can use uh, a mathematical treatment that takes you to something like a kpc equation which i'll show you later okay so with those preliminaries out of the way uh, let me show you the kind of experimental setup on which the measurements are done so this is a combustor a v flame combustor that's at uh, georgia tech in uh, tim lewen's lab and uh, uh, his students luke and ben have worked on this and uh, we're especially grateful to luke for the data some parts of the data uh, so essentially it's a system where you have this sta stable v flame that's set up on a flame holder and the flame holder can be oscillated uh, in the transverse direction at the same time below this holder uh, a flow is injected and you have two uh, plates perforated plates below this holder which you cannot see here and air is passed through them and turbulence gets generated and then the turbulence is uh, meets the flame so that's the setup that we have and you have cameras to kind of take pictures uh, to take videos and we use tio2 me scattering to detect the edge and there's also piv setup to uh, measure the flow field so this is a typical uh, snapshot of the flame where you can see the edge and if you binarize it you can kind of uh, uh, locally define the edge of the flame now of course there will be some holes and some islands of you know little flame lits but for uh, our purposes we neglect those things like this is a hole for example and this is a island so we neglect these small features and focus on the dominant uh, flame edge and if we do that you can extract out an edge that looks like the blue line you see here uh, so uh, a bit of uh, i mean just to set up the geometry of the problem so we have uh, in the direction let's say of the mean flow uh, we have the, we, we put in the y coordinate and the x coordinate is transverse to that and uh, this uh, zeta is the uh, location of the instantaneous flame and then we can define a mean and a prime variable to denote the fluctuations and so here you see the way i formulated it it appears to be single value uh, in reality you can see that it can be multi valued at some points but uh, that doesn't really contribute to analysis we've done some checks to make sure so one can simplify it for now and think of it as being single value so an important experimental point here is that the setup is inherently limited uh, in terms of spatial scales so the smallest spatial scale uh, of interest to us is the diffusive scale associated with the flame and then the larger scales are set effectively by the system size uh in fact a size less than that if you want to have approximately uh, isotropic uh, flow conditions and so on so you are fundamentally limited in terms of the range of spatial scales you can access unless you can build a huge combustor which is uh, was not uh, something we could do uh, so then but 
to help us on the other hand we had very uh, uh, reasonably accurate uh, high resolution temporal measurements so we could uh, have a single location uh, and you know measure the fluctuations of the flame and uh, also get decent information about the flow in time or in other words these snapshots were available at a uh, pretty good resolution in time so we have a decent range of scales temporally and so the rest of what i will be showing you i'll actually do in uh, the time domain rather than the space domain okay a final uh, word about the background turbulent flow so uh, these are just uh, pictures uh, for you know to set the stage here the background is the pi the field that extracted from piv it's the water city field you can see we don't have much uh, resolution again even in the piv field that's another reason why we don't really do the analysis in space but uh, we have the uh, field at various instances of time and one thing we can do is compute for example the uh, cross correlations of the fl uh, fluctuating flow field and you see that there are significant correlations towards the edges of the system but if you look in this boxed region uh, you see that these cross correlations come uh, become pretty small and that's a uh, indication that we are achieving at least locally uh, something that's close to being isotropic and we've done other checks to see this so that's just to show you that at least approximately one can think of uh, the flame being in uh, a kind of isotropic uh, homogeneous flow at least in this local region okay so uh, let me now begin by showing you some uh, measurements so what i'll be showing you so this on the left is the flame this uh, the curve is the instantaneous flame and uh, i'll be looking at the fluctuations of of the flame at different axial locations y so in this window you will see fluctuations pretty far from the flame holder that's y 5 times lambda c where lambda c is a, a decorrelation length scale uh, in the y direction and it's so it's it's a large length scale this lambda c so 5 lambda c is pretty really sampling the kind of large scale fluctuations of the flame and then in the second box you are we are coming closer to the flame and again measuring the fluctuations and in the third box we are looking at the increment of the fluctuations in time so you take the fluctuation at two different times at an interval of tau and you take the difference the usual way we would uh, measure we would uh, define increments except we are doing it now in time okay so let me play this movie uh, so you see the flame is undergoing its fluctuations uh, there are large kind of oscillations far from the flame holder and uh, that's and that's manifested here in the top box you can see this kind of bursting type of behavior so it really has this on off type dynamics and that's a consequence of the you know large scale dynamics of the system the coupling between uh, the burning and the flow that leads to you know the flame sometimes propagating very far and sometimes not at all and so that's what leads to this on off type bursting and you can see this has a clear intermittent characteristic so this is what would be called outer intermittency but if you come closer the flame always exists at that location that right, when you're closer uh, where this green dot is and so now you kind of lose that character and as i'll show you in the next slide it appears to be relatively gaussian but then if you look at the increment you once again see that you know there uh, that it does appear to be intermittent so uh, let's look at it in more detail through the pdfs in this slide so here again i'm just plotting the fluctuation at different axial uh, location so the dark color corresponds to the far from the you know the large scale motion and there you see this spike near zero the reason is that whenever the flame doesn't propagate all the way to the furthest location we just mark it as being zero and if i plot the flatness factor now of these pdfs so um, the fourth power fourth moment uh, versus the axial location you see that far far away i do see a high flatness indicative again of this outer intermittency or large scale intermittency but as i come close you start you really approach the gaussian value of 3 and so what this suggests now is that yes you have this flame does have this large scale kind of intermittent flapping but if one were to go close to the flame holder things would you know appear relatively tame and be uh, almost gaussian as you can see from this uh, the lightest pdf here the lightest color right and the dash line is a fitted gaussian okay but that's really not the whole story and that's uh, the main point of my talk so if you now look at the temporal increments 
over the time interval tau and then look at the pdf right and then do the usual thing that uh, is very familiar to all of us i'm sure that now as you decrease tau right at large tau you see what looks really to be gaussian that is the orange curve here but as you decrease tau and go to smaller scales you start seeing the strongly non gaussian behavior with these flat tails and this really looks uh, you know very much like what we would see in uh, if we would take let's say velocity increments in a turbulent flow and uh, from large scales where it's gaussian we start seeing non gaussian behavior so i think this is a you know clear telltale sign to uh, especially to people you know in in this field that this is going to be uh, intermittent and but then of course one can think about now looking at uh, the structure factors to see if there is multi scale but before i do that let me first uh, we first wanted to see whether there actually is a power law range of scaling in these fluctuations so uh, for that we looked at the power spectra uh, of our measurements uh, that would be like looking at let's say in um, another way of looking at the scaling of the second order structure factor and i'll come to that in a second but first we just looked at the spectra another reason being that people in this field typically plot uh, uh, the power spectra if they have temporal measurements uh, so this is what we're looking at here uh, this is the energy spectrum uh, you know over the frequency omega uh, non dimensionalized with the uh, large scale frequency associated with the integral uh, length of the turbulent flow and what you see is that once you come below the uh, large time scale uh, omega l you do hit this kind of uh, power law range and uh, eventually our measurements cannot resolve it so that you know, the stuff here is really just uh, because we are under under resolving we don't have the temporal resolution if we could go further we would presumably hit the uh, diffusive scales uh, corresponding to what's known as a coarsen scale that's omega c here this first dashed line and things would start to decay and uh, if you go even further you would hit the kolmogorov scale so we are not able to measure things up to there so within the range of our measurement we, it does appear like there is a power law range and that uh, exponent seems to be close to minus 2 uh, and we've done this for different flame configurations labeled here f1 f2 and we measured the exponents at different axial locations within that uh, box region which i had shown you in the piv diagram earlier where things are locally isotropic and so on and there we do see that we are relatively close to uh, an exponent of minus 2 so the main message is yes within this local regime of the flow the flame does show uh, what appears to be at least self similar fluctuations at first sight and then the question is where does this uh, where does this exponent minus 2 come from also to understand this let's look at uh, equation that describes the dynamics of a flame so if we think of the flame as being given by uh, a following surface right uh, g of uh, in two dimensions x y and t but you could extend it to 3 of course uh, being zero so really the contour of the zero contour of this g field is going to determine my flame and uh, this g then would obey a advection diffusion type equation uh, so you just have advection by the turbulent flow uh, in this term and then on the right hand side this first term is the self propagation of the flame uh, in the local normal direction where sl is the uh, burning speed so this is the speed that comes out of the combustion chemistry and uh, it's this rate at which this flame would propagate if we were in a quiescent flow sorry in a quiescent background in addition to this you have a kind of effective diffusion this d is not the molecular diffusivity it's what's known as the markstein diffusivity it's a kind of effective diffusion behavior of the flame and it's finite for us because remember i told you that our flame has a finite thickness and we are in that regime of things and then there are some corrections because the flame is not infinitesimally thin so those corrections are on the order of uh, the thickness of the flame delta now for our purposes we want to identify a kind of self similar range so we need to see if there scale separation so each of these terms can be associated with uh, a different length scale on the right hand side to see that more clearly i'm just using the definition of the normal here in terms of the gradient of g to get this term okay so uh, what are the scales that come out of here so the first term can lead to what's known as a gibson scale in other words it's just the length scale at which the burning speed right sl becomes equal to the uh, turnover let's say speed uh, becomes equal to the speed of the of an eddy of uh, size of that size so in other words lg is the scale at which if you look at a turbulent eddy of that scale you know using the usual uh, kolmogorov scaling that v goes as l to the 1/3 uh, 
uh, it, that velocity when it matches SL, that's the length scale, which is known as a Gibson scale. So in other words, fluctuations at this scale would be equally affected by the self propagation and the background turbulent flow. So this is one length scale. And this L here is the integral scale, the large integral scale of the flow. So it's this Gibson scale is given in terms of that. And V is the uh, RMS velocity. I can then also, the second term diffusive term then gives me a dissipative cutoff due to diffusion, which is uh, the Corson length scale. And it's related to the Kolmogorov scale via the Schmidt uh, number. In our problem, it's actually uh, a little larger than the Kolmogorov scale, as you saw earlier. And this delta F again is a small length scale, the thickness of the plate. So the main point is we do have a length, uh, uh, you know, a range of scale separation. So if L is the, uh, you know, integral scale of the flow, uh, closer to the system size. And if the uh, RMS velocity is much larger than the uh, intrinsic burning speed, you do have a scale separation with LG and certainly with the diffusive scales. So over that range, uh, right when you're saying essentially that you're smaller than the system size, but much larger than this Gibson scale or the Corson scale, then you can effectively neglect these terms. And what you see is you have something that looks just like the advection of a passive scalar within that sub range of scales. And so probably unsurprisingly, uh, it was shown, it's been known for quite a while and it's there in this book by Peters that the uh, power, the uh, sorry, spatial energy spectrum of the fluctuations of the flame uh, have this kind of uh, behavior where you do have a power law behavior over this you know, intermediate range, but then it hits this exponential decay first due to uh, the self-propagation. So the Gibson scale comes here and then later further decay due to the uh, diffusive effects. This is the Corson length scale. But the main point for us is that you have this K to the minus five thirds behavior and what is really the inertial uh, convective uh, you know, uh, regime of this flame. Uh, so, uh, Okay, so now we want to come back to, you know, uh, the time domain, right? So uh, we start with what is known in the spatial domain or in, you know, the wave number domain that the spectrum goes, goes as k to the minus five third. And then what we think of is a very simple argument. So basically, you imagine you have a flame uh, and this flame is now going to be perturbed by, you know, a range of eddies if we look at, if we think of it in a Kolmogorov uh, picture. And so each a given eddy, uh, of a size two pi by k, right, would be creating a perturbation of that length scale, and it would be associated with a velocity, of course, that goes as k to the minus one. So now, with this local velocity of that eddy of size two pi by k, I can think of a frequency that it would uh, produce on the flame surface. So that just dimensionally, that frequency is the velocity times uh, the wave number. So I get that a frequency goes as k to the two by three if I use the uh, scaling of the underlying flow, right? The inertial range scaling of the flow. And then with this relation, along with uh, just the simple fact, right? That the integral of the uh, power spectrum ultimately has to have the same content as the, as the spatial spectrum. I would then extract out my power spectrum E uh, to go as omega to the minus two. So uh, what we're saying here basically is if we start with the known spatial spectrum for the flame fluctuations and just use the inertial range scaling of the flow, uh, we should expect to see an exponent minus two in the power spectrum of my flame fluctuations. And that's actually what we see experimentally. Okay, so this is uh, just to see that, you know, it's the uh, measurements are consistent. Uh, and also it kind of helped us to think about things in the temporal domain. Uh, now let's return uh, to the question of intermittency by looking at the structure factors. So I come back to the increments of my flame fluctuation, and then I raise it to a power P and take the uh, average, or in this case, time average, uh, where things are stationary. And so I can define structure factors of order P. Now the second order structure factor will follow from my uh, the power spectrum. And I see that uh, second order structure factor goes as tau. And so if things are non-intermittent, a naive expectation would be that uh, the pth order structure factor should scale as tau to the P by two. So I, this P by two is my uh, you know straight line, let's say. Uh, but then when I actually calculate the zeta, sorry, when I calculate SPs and see how they scale in tau, uh, I do get a decent range of uh, scaling. Uh, but I see that it goes as tau to some exponent zeta p, where zeta p does not follow p by 2. Instead, it is concave and uh, strongly, uh, uh, I mean, it shows strong and anom anomalous scaling, as you can see here. 
so clearly this is uh, definitely intermittent and uh, it scales enormously in fact it saturates and this sort of saturation behavior is quite reminiscent of uh, uh, a passive scalar uh, the intermittency we see in passive scalars although it's uh, it seems stronger but it's hard to compare because right now these are the exponents for the temporal uh, scaling uh, so what does this uh, thing mean quickly uh, so basically we have this uh, i mean in in us in the passive scalar case this saturation indicates the is, is due to the fact physically that you have these ram cliff structures where you have uh, right perturbations of the order of the rms uh, amplitude but happening in you know the diffusive scales and if you can take the diffusive scales to smaller length scales to increase the reynolds number and the peclet numbers there then you would have these jumps rms jumps in shorter and shorter distances in our case since we are doing things in time it's really the flame th the same thing the flame even at small scales is undergoing very rapid fluctuation so it it advances or recedes by an amplitude of the root mean square fluctuation but in the diffusive time scale and if we could take this time scales to be smaller and smaller we would have these trap more increasingly rapid extreme events and now this has some implications for you know operation and heat release rates and things like this uh which we are yet to calculate but it certainly will be there uh also it would manifest in space possibly as this ram cliff kind of structures on the flame surface but we can't see this experimentally because we have a limited range of scales as i had said uh, so under, uh, to understand these things uh, more clearly it would be nice to have a simple model and that's where i'll uh, take you through the last couple of minutes so uh, uh, how can we come at a at, you know have a simple model to understand these flame fluctuations so if we return to the g equation Uh, let me start by assuming it to be single valued so this uh, the location of the flame is now given by h which is just a function of the transverse x i can then uh, rewrite my g equation in the following form uh, where this u and v are the velocity field i then make a further simplification i replace the flow uh, you know this is something we are all familiar with now with uh, uh, gaussian noise in fact i take it to be delta correlated in time later and then you see the equation now starts to look more and more like the kpz i have assumed here that the flow perpendicular to the flame uh, balances out its uh, uh, you know lamina flame speed so that the flame would stay within the region of interest uh, you could also just think of having a moving coordinate uh, now it still is not it's not really kpz but if you assume that the slopes are small uh you can say this dh dx is small and then you can simplify this term and you really do get kpz with now two noise forces so the first three terms are just kpz uh our beloved kpz but then you have two forcing one is the uh, forcing that comes from the velocity component perpendicular to the flame so that comes in additively but then you have the you know uh, tangential component which comes in multiplicative and this is what makes this uh, you know thing fundamentally different from the uh, uh, version of the forced kpz that most that have been, that has been mostly studied which is the additive noise case so we have this multiplicative noise uh, which should be inter interpreted in the stratonovich sense and that changes things as i'll show you in a second okay so this is pretty much the end so what we did is we just we just started looking at this now in terms of doing some calculations so we do stochastic simulations we take the noise to be delta correlated in time and have uh, you know a spatial uh, spectrum right now i've taken minus 5/3 because the noise we want to it to mimic the background flow and we've done simulations the, with the full equation i showed you before not the small slope version but the full equation which has a kpz like character so we do full simulations you know including both additive and multiplicative noise this is just showing you the perturbed uh, the flame fluctuation field in space and time and we do the same thing just with the additive noise which would be more like you know just additively forced uh, kpc and then i can calculate uh, the increments and their pdfs and you see that when if just just the additive forcing things remain gaussian but with the multiplicative forcing where you have this random advection effect you start seeing a non gaussian flare tails in the increments and i can calculate the you know exponents and uh, the first one is in space you see that there is some uh, indication of intermittency here and if you do it in time that gets even stronger so it does this uh, our initial calculations at least show that you know it's the random advection the multiplicative forcing that is producing the intermittency we are seeing uh, rather than the uh, self propagation aspect 
Okay, so with that, I'll conclude. The main thing we've seen here is that yes, flames have this large scale auto intermittency kind of behavior, uh, but they that all uh, if you go closer to the flame where things seem boring, it actually still is intermittent. Uh, and one needs to look at the structure factors to reveal that. And uh, we've shown the first experimental evidence for this kind of inner intermittency, but the story is a familiar one to those of us who come from to come to this problem, you know, from turbulence. Uh, and more recently, what we're doing is to try to develop some kind of theory of this using this KPZ-like equation, but accounting for the multiplicative spatiotemporal multiplicative norms. Uh, so with that, uh, thanks. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take uh, questions if there's time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, sir. I, I, I have to question. I remember, like, 